Okay. This morning we want to share about the spy anointing. How many know we're at war? How good is a battle without intelligence? God made provision in Scripture in the, what we're going to study this morning. He typed and shadowed spying and intelligence. And so I want to share with you what the Lord shared with me some years ago, plus what he shared with me as I was studying it again. I've called it the results of judging by sight. How are we to walk? By faith and not by sight. Now I won't ask you how many of you walk by sight. I'm talking spiritually now, not naturally. You don't close your eyes and walk down the street. Not a good plan. All right. So here's a review of, of uh, chapter 12. Because last week we went into Genesis, and this is the passage that uh, precedes in Numbers 12, precedes and sets the stage for our t Numbers 13. And Marion and Aaron, uh, Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he married, for she, he had married a, an Ethiopian woman. Moses' wife, Zipporah, was a Midianite or an Ethiopian. Now remember, Midianites were actually cousins of Israel. Okay? So they came from the same father, but not the same mother. But that means that Moses married a black woman. In this scenario here, God speaks against racism and defends Moses, not only Moses marrying of an Ethiopian woman, but of Moses' leadership. God came down to defend her and Moses' choice of her as a wife. This was a racist issue. God stood with Moses, both defending his leadership and his choice of an Ethiopian wife. Although this was the issue, it is not the real reason for rebellion. How many know that we will often find issues that are really aren't the reason? The reason is something deeper. The reason is something internal. It's not an external thing. We need to remember that not only in church issues, but in marriage issues. Marriage issues are rarely what the he said, she said. Come on now. Amen. They're usually something deeper than that. But if we can get distracted by the he said, she said, we don't have to deal with the issues. Oh, I, did I say that out loud? <laughs> when issues are brought up, often they hide the real reason and the motivation of the heart. The real reason is expressed in the next verse. It was a leadership issue. By the way, let me make this clear. Miriam was not an addendum to the leadership. Miriam was part of the leadership. And the reason I say that is there's so much out there against women in ministry. But if you will carefully examine the scripture, God down through the ages has chosen women, not because he didn't have a man to fill the boots. Men. My women, I thought you might be on my side. <laughs> See, we, we've in Christ there is neither. There, that word neither in the original means there's not any male, there's not any female. What we need in the pulpit and in leadership is Christ himself Amen. manifested through those two genders. Amen. Okay? And they said, Hath not the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. It was not a case of God not speaking through Aaron and Miriam. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made the statement. God did not say whether it's spoken through them or not. And sometimes, folks, we make statements for Scripture it doesn't make for itself. But my thinking and my feeling is that God had spoken through them. 
Problem being, they didn't have the final authority. There will always be someone who has the final authority in a house, or you've got a headless horseman. And so there's so much, um, well, I call it, there's so much anti-leadership, there's so much um, going on in the earth today that we often forget that God has senior leadership. Now, in the Godhead, all three are equal, right? And yet the two submit to the Father. True submission is a choice, not a force. And the church of God must remember that. Because if it's a choice, here's the problem. I don't want to recognize someone greater than I am. Come on. And they wanted to say, we have the same authority. But God did not invest them with the same authority. He invested them with authority, but not the same. The reality was a challenge to seniority of leadership and strength of authority of Moses' voice in governing the affairs of Israel. God used it to validate Moses' call as the senior man in Israel or... This is where it relates and brings it right into the New Testament. Acts 7.38 calls Israel in the wilderness the church in the wilderness. Or the ecclesia in the wilderness. The called out ones in the wilderness. And he's the one that put the authority there. Moses would not defend himself. By the way, how many know this is a difficult statement? But, 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 put your butts in the ashtray. (laughs) Or get rid of your goat nature. But, but, but. (laughs) Moses would not defend himself, so God called a meeting of senior leadership. The apostle Moses, the prophetess Miriam, and the teacher Aaron. Now, God has said in the first, first, in the church first, apostles, secondarily, thirdly. Oh, you mean Miriam was right up there. Just let that rest in your spirit. All right. Numbers 12, 3 and 4. Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake. Suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out ye three, where? Unto the center of my presence. All discipline in the body of Christ must be done in the presence of God. Please hear that. We have not done that in the past. And because of that, we've had split after split, after split. Come out ye three under the tabernacle of the congregation, and they three came out. Meekness is, and here's the definition, meekness is a quiet, gentle strength, that's not quite a gentle, it shouldn't be quite, it should be a quiet, gentle strength, and security in your place or position that allows God to defend you, and you do not have to defend yourself. Let me say this. I have proven this over 54 years of ministry. It works, but here's the, here's the rub. It takes longer. When God defends you, it takes longer because he has to set the stage for the right time so that the person rising up against you knows it's God doing it. Amen. Okay? Not everyone was called to the meeting. This was not the council. This was the leadership. God was in some sense covering Aaron and Miriam. Why? Because he didn't do it publicly. Joshua the evangelist and her the pastor were not called. That was the five top leadership. Two of them were not called. So this to me sounds like that Moses and Aaron and 
Miriam were complaining directly to Moses. And it was not an open thing. Because if it's an open thing, God will correct it openly. Okay? The question of consequence, punishment, and judgment is raised by God's treatment of Miriam. And I wanted to put this slide in here because in the body of Christ, too often we call everything judgment. But there are consequences. If you do this, the resulting consequence, good or bad, is. And throughout Scripture, you'll find God letting the consequences correct the person. It's not that anybody says anything. It's that God says your backslidings will correct you. From Jeremiah. Punishment. Something has been done wrong and corrective punishment is... Notice that corrective punishment is administered but is not necessarily a permanent condition. This is what happened to Miriam. What God allowed to happen to her was not permanent. The lesson was permanent. You never hear insurrection again. The lesson was permanent, but the punishment was not. Judgment, not many things in Scripture are actually called judgment. Even in judgment, God wants to bring us to repentance and restoration. Matthew 12 and 20 says, He brings forth judgment unto victory. God hates to have to bring judgment that doesn't come forth to victory and truth. We need to catch that. That needs to be our attitude in dealing with others when they are wronging us. Lord, how do I redeem this situation? How do we redeem the friendship or redeem the relationship? Now, Mary's punishment was seven days, for seven days was being leprous. Consider this. Leprosy was considered a death sentence. Numbers 12 and 12, Aaron in interceding for her said, her said, let her not be as one dead. Natural leprosy, nerves become dead, causing insensitivity. And you have a definition there from the Wikipedia. Leprosy infection can lead to damage of the nerves and respiratory tract, skin and eyes. By the way, if you have not read the, I call them spiritual classics, uh, spirit, um, no, spiritual parallel is what I wrote. In His Image by Dr. Paul Brand, and what's the other one? Do you remember? Pain, the well, Pain is the Gift Nobody Wants. They changed the title of that, by the way, to just Pain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it's because they, they had problems selling the book but listen, pain is a vital thing. We don't like it, but it's vital. It's the body's alarm telling you something's not right. Okay. Spiritual leprosy, a becoming insensitive to the Spirit of God and the Word of God in any area. Sin can cause leprosy, but leprosy is not sin. Spiritual leprosy. By the way, the name of the other book is In His Image by Dr. Paul Brand of Philip Yancey. Note this. The next event is a rebellion against God among the chosen, anointed, imparted into leadership. We need to see this because just because we're leadership does not mean we're safe. The enemy, in fact, the enemy is going to attack the leadership. You need to pray for your leadership. It is a rebellion manifesting hidden unbelief in God's ability to do what he said he's going to do. Often God tests us, not in a mean way, not to show him what's going on inside, but to show us. Because often we don't know our own heart until the test comes. And then out of the abundance of the heart, we let everybody know where we're at. <laughs> oh, yeah, the mouth speaks, right. There are times when we judge with the five senses and judge wrongly. This incident in Israel's history teaches us important lessons from which we can draw vital spiritual parallels. Remember, 
My stand in the Old Testament is it's all prophetic. And what is prophetic of is a spiritual realm that we have ignored down through the years. With this event, there were consequences that affected the whole church in the wilderness. Here's a principle. If we judge by sight, we open ourselves to doubt, fear, and unbelief. Judging by sight has rippling effects in the individual. Now, all of us have seen it in our own lives. Judging by sight has rippling effects in the local body corporate. But judging by sight can also impede the forward movement of the Israel of God or the church at large. There are whole decisions that have delaying, not defeating effects, but delaying effects on the whole corporate body of Christ. And we're going to see that illustration in a moment. In Numbers 13, 2, send thou men that they may search out the land of Canaan, which, I've, which I have what? Yeah. I give unto the children of Israel. That's important because sometimes when we hear God's going to give us something, we expect him to hand it to us without any problem. That is a fallacy. Nowhere in Scripture does that happen at this dimension. Which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among you. There is a searching out of the promised land. I call it the spying anointed that's needed. We have come to the edge of time when God is taking the church into what he's promised her and everything he purchased for her on the cross. We cannot go in blind. There are certain things that cannot be known about our promised land until we come to the edge of entering. Something, God, I want to know. You aren't to the edge of the land yet. Spies are ones who have already been chosen for a leadership position and have been functioning in leadership for a while. We need to hear that. Why? Because these were not novices that God sent in. Okay? A list of what they were to assess shows us the level of discernment they were supposed to have. This was a test of 18 months. Now listen carefully. 18 months of walking in that which should bond you to God and his plan. This, and in that, they had all heard God. Every Israelite alive at that time had heard God. Don't you wish everyone in the church would hear God? Yeah. But would our reaction be the same as Israel's? This test revealed how much had been done in the leaders through the wilderness journey and God's supernatural working in their midst. By the way, some of these elders had seen God. They went into the mountain with Moses and what's it say? They saw God. That was at Mount Sinai. How many know this? The going into the land was beyond Mount Sinai. Sometimes we read this, but we don't look at the, at the awesome uh, import of what they'd already experienced of God. By the way, sometimes it scares me with what I've experienced of God and is it possible that when God begins to take me into what he's promised me, I say, but, 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 but. All of these things have spiritual parallels in the life of the church today. Remember, the 70 elders over the whole nation had been chosen and set in by God before this time. They were not set in by Moses. They were set in by God. God said, bring them to the tabernacle and I will come down. Yep. By the way, that's the way leadership should be set in. Yes. Oh, anyway, I won't go there. I'll try and behave this morning. It's not easy, you know that. <laughs> They had experienced God's transfer of abilities and anointings from Moses to themselves. 
And I will remind you that Moses had not been depleted by any of that. But God said clearly, I will come down. I will take of the spirit that's on you and put them on the set, put it on the 70. This means they were considered the most mature leaders of their tribes. We need men and women to be anointed to be spies today. They needed to learn to judge according to what God says rather than by what they see, hear, and feel. Amen. Lord, do that in your church today. Amen. Amen. So the foundation experience of the spies, Numbers 13.3, 3, and Moses' command, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were heads of the children of Israel. They were sent into the promised land from a wilderness of Paran, which means shaking. When you're being shaken, God's getting ready to take you forward. Amen. My, but it's quiet out there. Amen. We need to see these things because there's a, a gospel out there that tries to keep us from recognizing the tools of God to move us forward. They had seen God do, uh, this is indicative of the trying of their faith from 1 Peter 1 and 7. They had seen God do the miracles in Egypt which should have built their faith. They had been sustained by miracles for over 18 months. They had been led by the Spirit for over 18 months. That was a daily thing. That was not once in a You know, we see a miracle and we're amazed. They were led by miracles. They were fed by miracles. And that's just under the old covenant, folks. God wants to bring us into that dimension of the moving of the Spirit. But they didn't learn. They were senior leaders of the tribes they belonged to. Now, the meaning of the names of the ones chosen from each tribe suggests a wide variety of spiritual experiences when it's interpreted spiritually. And I did this because sometimes we think those whom God uses are elite. And they, you have to qualify for certain things. And if you haven't had this experience, you can't have that experience. If you haven't gone through this, you can't go there. Listen carefully. We're going to try and go through this quickly because there are 12 of them. Okay? Reuben means see a son, and from him Shama the renown, uh, means to stun or devastate or de be destitute and to wonder. Even though his heritage was seeing a son, did he judge only by seeing in the natural? How many know we often judge things by our history? Yeah. How many know that's could be a fallacy. Because our histories are kind of rugged, aren't they? I say sometimes I'm here in spite of the body of Christ. I've been through betrayals. I've been through a number of things. Here is my anchor. The word of God says it's possible. Therefore, I'm going to hang in till it happens. Come on. If I've never seen it, if the body of Christ has never seen it yet, God has promised some things for the last days that the body of Christ down through history has never seen. Amen. Therefore, I must believe God in the light of my future, not in the light of my past. Yeah. Yeah. This speaks of his journey experientially. These experiences had been had these experiences had been his and had shaped his life. How many knows our experience shape our lives? Because he was chosen as a leader before, it indicates he gained some wisdom throughout his life. But was he healed from the, those experiences that brought the wisdom? Did the trauma that he would have experienced through them leave wounds that factored in his decision against going into the land? Some of your experience of the past, if you interpret the present in the light of the past, will keep you from going into what God has for your future. Yeah. Simeon means 
uh, Shaphat means to judge. Is it possible that he had some judgmentalism in him? Did he, Simeon, by the way, means hearing. Did he hear things as right and wrong as from the tree of the knowledge? knowledge. Do you know that tree, we're still eating from it? I haven't got time to illustrate a number of those things, but just think about that. I want to hear as God wants me to hear. I want to hear what he's saying above all the other voices. Paul said there are many voices in the world and none of them without significance. But what one do we want to hear? We want to hear his voice because he said, my sheep know my voice and here's where I want to come. And another they will not hear. That's where I want to be. I don't want to hear any other voice. I hear what they're saying, but I don't want to hear what they're saying inside. In the depth of my heart, in the depth of my hearing, in the depth of my spirit. Judah. Of course, we knew Judah means celebrate with praise. But Caleb came from there, and Caleb means forcible. And Paul said, I press toward the mark for the... I press. I have an initiative that causes me to press into God. It's my choice. The kingdom suffers violence, violence and the violent take it, it. take it. That means they get it. I want to get it. I don't want to just hear it. I want to get it. To celebrate with praise reminds us of David being violent in his worship experience as he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to the center of Israel's worship. God today is bringing his presence back to the center of worship. We want the presence of God because you know in the presence of God, things change. People change. And by the way, I don't like me as me is. I need to be changed. Amen. My wife said, <laughs> she whispered something over there. She, she didn't want to say it out loud, whatever it was. <laughs> From the tribe of Issachar was Egel, the avenger. He who knows the promise of God to bring a reward, which is what Israel means, also knows God as the avenger. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 6 talks about the Lord as the avenger. If I will let him, he will avenge me of my adversaries. Who's the biggest adversary you need to be avenged? Satan himself. If I will let him. Often I interfere with God's desire to avenge me. Because I take it on myself to do it. How many know that never works out right? <laughs> All right. From Ephraim came Joshua, the deliverer, salvation. And Ephraim was the tribe of double blessing. God wants to bring us into leadership that releases the double blessing in our life, and that will bring us into deliverance. Joshua uh, apportioned to all of Israel their inheritance. There's coming a leadership, a corporate leadership in the body of Christ, I believe, that is called to apportion to the people of God everything that God has called them to walk into. Hallelujah. Their Amen. destiny. Amen. Benjamin means son of the right hand. And the guy that came from him was Palti. His name means delivered. The son From the son of the right hand comes one who has been delivered or experiences the delivering hand of God. All these are experiences that speak of where these people came from spiritually. It's not just from one group that are an elite group. These have experienced many things from God himself. Zebulun, which means habitation. Gadil, the fortune of God. From he who knows God as his habitation come ones who knows the fortune of God. Here's the question. Does he know the wealth of the hidden riches of secret places or the treasures of darkness from Isaiah 45 and 3? These are spiritual experiences that we can have. He said, I will give you. I'm a taker. 
How about you? I want to take all that God wants to give. Now, it's going to change me. It's going to test my attitudes. But I want everything that God has to give. Amen. Amen. From Joseph. And, and Joseph is represented by Manasseh in this, this uh, situation, comes Gadai. The root means fortunate. One, from one who has known the addition of God and God's ability to cause forgetting of pain and wounding comes one who, who's with the attitude of feeling fortunate, I believe, in his relationship with God. Folks, there are some things you need God to help you forget. It's time for us to forget those things which are behind, sometimes both good and bad. Because sometimes the good we remember can keep us from going on to the best of God. Selah, think on that one. From the tribe of Dan, Emil. The people of God, from the tribe who had experienced God as judge, comes one who knows the truth concerning the people of God or the corporate body of Christ. From Asher, which means happy, comes Sether, which means hidden. From the tribe expressing the happy, Psalms 144, verse 15, happy is the people who is in such a case, comes one who knows what it is to be one of the hidden ones of God from Psalm 83 and 3. What I'm trying to do is expand your understanding of those that God will use. Okay? From Naphtali, which means the wrestling of God. Of course, none of you wrestle with anything. Everything is smooth. And you don't have any problems. That's why you're here this morning. From the tribe that knows the wrestling of God, or the wrestling with God, like Jacob, or the wrestling with principalities, comes one who has experienced spiritual combat and desires to hide from himself or to hide. He also knows the bringing of every thought into captivity from 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Finally, Gad. From Gad comes Gu Gu? I'm not sure how to pronounce that one. His name means... Hmm? You ask two rabbis and get three opinions. <laughs> okay, so I, so I can pronounce it like I think Amen. it is. Amen. All right. Which means majesty of God. From the tribe that represents a troop and also represents the overcomer comes one who knows the majesty of God and God as almighty. By the way, God's going to reveal himself again as the almighty. He's going to cause situations to come that there's no way we can handle. And we will call on the almighty. It's, you know, in the book of Revelation, it's one of the, the revelation that came to John in the first chapter. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. That first chapter of Revelation, recognizing that those are the revelation that govern the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus that govern the book of Revelation. It's an awesome chapter. I think it took me 21 weeks to get through the first chapter when I taught it, ex expounding on it. Why? Because we need to know what God wants to give us, how he wants to reveal himself. It is not just coming to church on uh, or coming to Shabbat or coming coming to a weeknight meeting. It's coming to him and having him reveal himself. And to some of you, he will only reveal one or two of those. And those are yours to express. He will work those in you so that your life style and your life theme manifest that particular aspect of God. It's corporately together in the end time that the whole of who he is is seen. It's not in one individual. Okay? I wish I had time to go on that one, I'll tell you. 
But we need to catch these things. There's a great mixture of experiences represented in this list, both negative and positive. So we go from sonship, see his son or Reuben, to the overcomer represented by Gad, or starting with vision and ending in victory. Woohoo! All right. Each one could also represent a seeing from a different perspective. The pairing of the tribe with the experiences is an interesting study which we briefly outlined. Remember that each had inherited from the son of Jacob, who was their progenitor, the nature and prophetic destiny inherent in the name of the tribe. There are some things, and sometimes, right, uh, just recently I made contact with one of my relatives. I thought I was doing well. I had 525, 26 on my ancestry account. She found 1,700 and some. Oh my God. Wow. But listen, here's one of the things I found about my family. There was someone in every generation that was at the forefront of what God was doing. Wow. That's what I want. I want that inheritance. I'm wrestling with all the negative inheritance, but I also want the good inheritance. And sometimes we forget that because somebody keeps pointing and shining light on all our skeletons. They're skeletons. There's no meat on them. Bury them. All right. <laughs> the rich spiritual inheritance is important these men went into this assignment from a rich heritage spiritually here's a question had they quickly forgot all that God had done for them in Egypt and during the wilderness time I mean when you take each one of the miracles that they live by and if that happened today it would be astounding. And yet God says that we're going into a day of greater things. My mind gets blown. Does yours? Yes. Or do we just take it as, oh, that's nice writing. <laughs> or are we going to begin to believe God for what he said he's going to do? Yes. That's where I want to go. Amen. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Had they become used to the miracles of God, but could not believe beyond their current experience. Now we have some people in, in the body of Christ who've had some awesome experiences with God. But when God challenges them with something beyond where they've been, their unbelief shows up. God, I believe. Lord, I believe. Help thou. I need help. I don't know about you, but I need help to get rid of all the rest of my unbelief? Yeah. Is it that they could not believe for something greater than they had seen to that point? They just seen some pretty great things. Not only was the individual memory affected, but the corporate memory was affected, and it was manifest how much of Egypt was still in the ten spies of the ten leaders. Only Moses, Joshua, and Caleb had their, had their mindsets changed from Egyptian and slave mentality to become an overcome to an overcoming mentality and a confidence in God's ability. Now, we focus so much on the ten negative, but listen, God was able to take Moses or Joshua and Caleb, who started with the same mindset, and changed their mindset. In 18 months. That's the type of the quick work that God said he was going to do in the last days. And cut it short in righteousness. God said he's going to do this thing whether we are in it or not. My cry is, God, I want to be in it. I want to be in on it. I want to be among that people who make it through and get their mindset changed from a slave or welfare mentality, even a spiritual welfare mentality, to an overcomer mentality. Amen. Now, here was what God said, or what, yeah, what God said to tell Moses the spies to look for. Numbers 13, 18. See the land. What is it? What it is. 
the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, whether they be few or many. They didn't know they couldn't find that out till they got to the edge of their promises. Let me say this again. There are some things that you want to know, but you're not going to know until you get to the edge of your promises. God has a destiny, a positive destiny for each one of us. Not just for CMC and you might be in on it. But for each one of you, he has laid out a plan before the beginning of time. You were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Lord, what did you choose me for? How many have asked the question? Yeah. Come on. Because he put it in you to do it. Yeah. Some of those desires you've had that the enemy's been pounding you about are actually, and you can't get rid of, you've tried the casting them out and they don't go. You've tried wrestling them down and they don't go. Some of them may well be God saying, hey, wake up and smell the coffee. Because I, he's going to give me what? the desires of my heart. So I ask him to give me his desire for my heart, and then when that rises up, I rebuke it. What's wrong with this picture? Find out what the land is that they dwell in, whether it's good or bad. What cities they be that, dwell, that they dwell in, whether in camps or strongholds. Find out what the land is, whether it's fat or lean. Find out whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time, catch this. Now the time was the time of first ripe grapes. Is that significant? It sure is. Because that means it was close to Feast of Tabernacles. Doesn't it? Because the Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration of fruit harvest. And the end of the harvest year. They went two by two at least, indicated by the need, by the need for two to carry one bunch of grapes. I like that. That is definitely fruitful. <laughs> if I carry one bunch of grapes, I can carry it in one hand, with three fingers. But not here. The place where God is taking us is so fruitful, we can't take it by ourselves. That's right. That's right. Let me say that again. The place that God is taking us is so fruitful, we cannot take it by ourselves. We can't even harvest the fruit by ourselves. We need help. So you better get to know the folks around you. You better get to love them because these are going to help you bring in your harvest. They spent 40 days walking the length and breadth of the land. It's almost like that different teams went in different places in the land. This would make the report a collaboration of all the teams saw and experienced in the land. I hope we hear that. If it is a type and shadow, and I believe it is, you cannot know the fullness of your destiny without others sharing with you what they've seen and experienced. It is going in together. In the end time, everything is corporate. Yes, we have our individual experiences, but that's to work in us something so we can become corporate. Yeah. One body. One body. One mind. One, one hope of our calling. Come on now. Amen. Now it became evident there were two opinions. Therefore, two leaders, even though Moses appointed Joshua as the head of the spying contingent. What do you mean two leaders? Someone led the ten. Someone was the agitator. Okay. They searched the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehoboth. Zin means crag or a steep rock face in this instance. And it was in the wilderness or a place of barrenness. In your walk with God, even in your promised land, there are going to be barren times. 
I didn't say I like it. You didn't see me say that. You didn't hear me say that. But there are going to be barren times. And I need not think that God has forsaken me just because I go through a barren wilderness. Yes, this too shall pass, or I shall pass through it. Don't get, don't camp. You don't have to camp there. You may have to spend a night or two there, but don't camp there. God will often start us in a barren place experientially, moving us from there to a better land or place. Rahab means a wide place, an avenue or place. In this case, it was a place of abundance. God wants to move you from your barrenness into a place of abundance. Amen. And stop thinking about money. You know... Love makes the world go round, but money greases the wheel. Pass the grease, please. All right. Uh, is, isn't that the way we think? God makes the world go round. God, through love, makes the world go round. Amen. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. Not that you're wealthy. Not that you have lots of stuff. But that you love one another. Amen. And you know, that's going into eternity. Even if I become a billionaire, that's not going into eternity. In fact, it might make it harder for me to get to eternity. Because I don't live by faith then, I just reach in the bank account. Oh, well, we won't go there. <clears throat> Hamoth, a walled or protected place. We're called to come into him who is a protected place. That protected place is a place in him, the only safe place in the universe. Yes, amen. They saw everything from barrenness to full fruitfulness in the land of, was in their land of promise. Are you hearing that? In your land of promise is everything from barrenness to fruitfulness. But God is going to take you from the barrenness into the fruitfulness. That's the journey of God. God wants us to spy out the land and know the spiritual geography, but also realize that there are squatters on our promises. Squatters taking advantage of God's promises to us. Remember, God said to Israel, this land is yours from before the foundation of the world. The folks that lived there were squatters. The folks that are taking advantage of God's promises to you are squatters. The spirits taking advantages of God's promises to you are squatters. It's time to kick them out. Amen. But it's going to be warfare. It's going to be in a change from welfare mentality to warfare mentality. I didn't say demon chasing. I've been around long enough to see people who have demons and doorknobs. <laughs> Everything is a demon. No, some of it's your flesh. Amen. The demon couldn't be there if it weren't for your flesh. Oh, we better not go there. We'll teach a course on deliverance later. Okay? I tried to cast out the flesh. I honestly did. I went through a year with a group that was trying to cast out the flesh. And I became more fleshy. Because what you focus on, what you water, increases. I mean, no, I got delivered from that. Not from the flesh, but from trying to deliver me from the flesh. Just want to make that clear. All right. There's spiritual geography in our promised land. There's two studies I've done. And I want to do a study on the geography of the promised land spiritually. I found out there are seven rivers. How many know that it says, out of your innermost being shall flow? Rivers of living water. And God said to me, there are seven rivers. I said, no, there aren't. Guess what? He was right again. <laughs> and then he said, there are seven mountains. And they aren't the seven mountains that a number of people are talking about in the earth today. Those, those are valid, 
but he said there's Jesus had seven mountaintop experiences I want you to study those because you're called to walk where he walked okay just throw that out there moving right along now that I've got you frustrated <laughs> All right, the report. They cut down a bunch of grapes that it took two men to carry. It was so large. They brought other fruit of the land also. Remember, this was the time of the first ripe grapes. Also, other fruits uh, was also being harvested. This makes it about the Feast of Tabernacles time. Now, we've talked about the, the barley harvest at Pentecost or at uh, Passover. We've talked about the... Uh, Wheat harvest at, at Pentecost, but the fruit harvest is at the harvest or is at the Feast of Tabernacles. All three feasts are harvest feasts. Okay, that's important to remember because if God is taking the church through it, we're coming into the time of fruitfulness. Amen. Let me try that one again. <laughs> I said, if God is taking the church through it, then we're coming into the time of fruitfulness. Amen. You know, God has no quick grow. He has no miracle grow. He does everything the hard way and the long way. But know this, he's going to bring forth everything that the three feasts speak of in the body of Christ. Okay? They traversed the land as instructed, observing the parameters and things Moses had set out. They came back to report their findings. It's important to note that the reports from the group were the same, but the attitudes were different. They all saw the same stuff. But their attitude toward what they saw was different. The report in Numbers 13, 27 to 29. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest, and surely it is a land that floweth with milk and honey. That's because they had great cow operation. All right. <laughs> and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, Today we would say, but, okay? The people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, I mean the Amorites, dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. All, by the way, all the tribes in the land are not types of demons. They're types of problems in your flesh. I won't ask you to out loud identify these things on the right, but they're in your notes. All right. But the thing is, they are in the land. They're the squatters in your personal land. They're the squatters in the local church. They're the squatters in the body of Christ. God's going to deal with them if you will let him. Numbers 13.30 And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Didn't say we're well able to subsume or whatever. He said we're able to over. In other words, Caleb had an overcoming attitude, not a subjection attitude. Numbers 14, 7 to 9. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land that floweth milk and honey. Only rebel ye, rebel not ye against who? Not Moses, the Lord. the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defenses departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. 
Numbers 14, 24, but my servant Caleb, because he had Maybe what? Another spirit. another spirit with him and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. By the way, that word shall means it's impossible for it not to happen. I like that. Yeah. I want to have a shell attitude. Yeah. Not S-H-E-L-L. <laughs> but an S-H-A-L-L. In Numbers 13, 32 to 33, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we've gone to search it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And there, were, there we saw giants and the sons of Anak, which come from the giants. And we were in, here, catch this, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. As you see yourself in through the enemy's eyes or through the enemy's eyes, so shall your destiny and battle be ordered. Say that again. Wow. As you see yourself through the enemy's eyes, so shall your destiny in battle be ordered. Wow. You either see yourself through God's eyes or you see yourself through the enemy's eyes. That determines whether you win or lose. I, there's a quote from T.D. Jakes. Grasshoppers don't eat grapes. <laughs> In other words, those who thought they were grasshoppers didn't get to go into the land. They didn't eat of that which God said was theirs from the foundation of the world. Numbers 14.9 Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. And every communion service we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, daily bread. our giants. No? That's good. That's good. Our daily bread. They are bread for us. Amen. My, but it got quiet out there. <laughs> it's time. By the way, he said in Isaiah that our bread and water are sure. There's a different perspective, isn't it? Thank you, Lord. We get upset when the giants come. They're bread for us. God's trying to feed us. Prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. What's on the table? The enemy. Time to eat lunch. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's an ability that God can give that allows one to see into the realm of the spirit and discern what the enemy's logistics are. God is looking for men and women who will commit to searching out the land of inheritance for one personal spiritual inheritance. By the way, your spiritual inheritance does not get consumed by the local body's inheritance. You have an, every one in Israel was given a personal inheritance, a personal portion of land. Then the tribes were given a portion. Then the nation was given a portion. Or there's a local corporate spiritual inheritance and there's an inheritance for the universal body of Christ. It's time to rise up and look at the inheritance and get the attitude that, Moses, or that uh, Joshua and Caleb had. There's an attitude that equals another spirit that will let you believe things from God's perspective no matter what things look like. Joshua and Caleb believed what God had said, not what they saw. Although all 12 spies saw the same things, the attitude they had made the difference in the report. Is it possible that the state of their relationship with God factored into the report as well? Joshua spent time in the tabernacle. Remember, Moses went out to speak to the people. Joshua, by the way, who didn't belong to the tribe of Levi, but got into the tabernacle anyway. Hmm. 
There's a whole other teaching, isn't it? And Caleb believed God rather than what they saw. There's a, something the Lord spoke to me this morning as I was just getting ready in my office there. He said this, every generation is given the opportunity to go into what God had inherit, God had lined up for that generation of inheritance. It's time a people chose rather than to say, no, we can't go there, to say, God, by your grace, by your help, and by your anointing, we are going to come there. Let's pray. Father, we need your eyes to be able to see what's hidden within the, uh, behind the enemy lines. We need you to draw our attention to what you want us to see. We need the anointing of Joshua and Caleb to see it from your perspective as well. Would you create in us the ability to have seeing eyes and hearing ears? Give us a stealth ability. Cause us to be so hidden in you that the enemy cannot sense when we are spying or even know we're in what he thinks is his territory. Lead us, Holy Spirit, into learning to collect intelligence under an anointing of being hidden by you, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.